Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. God is not going to lie to you. He has not lied to you. And everything in his word is truth. It's true. Now, I want you to know something. If you are suffering in your body from some type of ailment, and you have believed for your healing, but you don't see the manifestation of that healing right now, and you're wondering what it is you have done wrong, what it is you have prayed wrong, what it is you should have done that you haven't done, or what did I do to deserve this, let me remind you of something. There is now, therefore, no condemnation. Let's take a look at that scripture. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you born again? Then it qualifies it. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, if you have sought God for your healing, then you have not operated in the flesh. That is a spiritual thing. And so I'm just going to tell you right now, do not be condemned. I know of some people who quit going to church because they got sick. And they were concerned that some Christian friend of theirs might say, well, because you're sick, you just don't have enough faith. You must not be walking with the Lord. Well, let's counsel. Let's counsel and see what it is that you've done wrong. I don't know if you ever noticed this but uh, in the Bible, but Jesus didn't set up counseling sessions with people. And when they had done something, he healed them, and then he told them, go and sin no more. He didn't dig into their past and try to find out what psychological thing has happened in your past to prevent your healing. Maybe your mama took you off the potty way too quick. You know, you just didn't get trained right. Maybe you were abused. Maybe not. What's happening to me? What have I done? There is therefore now no condemnation. Do not allow yourself to get condemned. That's what the devil wants to do. If you allow condemnation to come into you and think, what did I do to get this? It's just like Eric's song a few moments ago. This trial that I'm going through, you know, wh what have I done, Lord? If the devil can put you into that mode, that can slow down your healing process. Because that is not faith, that is doubt. See, the Lord said, if you want healing, ask and you can have it. And you asked and you didn't see it. So now the enemy tries to make you think you didn't have it because you did something wrong. That's not faith. That's doubt. You say, well, I, I was believing. Well, see, faith is believing all the time. The definition of doubt is not that somebody never believes. It's that they believe part of the time, and part of the time they question it. And they go, well, I don't know, maybe I believe this. But then again, and the Bible says, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed back and forth. No, we need to be consistent. And if God said it, we believe it. Isn't that, isn't that a good concept? If God says it, I'm just going to believe it. And so many people, 
when they say, why is this happening to me? They think that there's something special. That the devil has singled you out. Among all the billions of people on the earth, he has singled you out to torment you because you're special. <laughs> well, evidently, some people were thinking that way back during the time of Peter. So he wrote this. He said in 1 Peter 4.12, he said, Beloved, so when he says beloved, that's talking to the church. Beloved, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. As though something strange, that some strange thing has happened to you. Hmm. Well, don't feel condemned and don't feel like you're singled out. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are tempted. The Scripture says that Jesus overcame. We are not special in that regard. That's why there should be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let the enemy put a guilt trip on you. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty because somebody in your family is sick. Like it's your fault. You didn't pray enough. You didn't fast enough. Hmm. Well, what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, what's the next verse say? For he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. Condemnation is not from God. Say that with me. Condemnation is not from God. When you feel guilty and condemned, that's not God talking to you. Now, some people say, well, but the Holy Spirit convicts us. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is that urging to do right when you haven't been. Condemnation means you have done wrong and you are going to pay the price. You are condemned. No, you are not condemned. Wow. <laughs> Listen to this story in John 8.10. Remember when the, the woman came in, she was caught in adultery? I guess she was all by herself because they didn't bring the man. Oh, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they brought the woman in, and they threw her on the, on the ground, and Jesus wrote in the ground. Do you remember that story in the Bible? It, then it says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, that's after he wrote into the ground, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Hello, this lady was caught in the act of adultery. The Bible says, in the very act. Almost seems like a setup to me. I think, I think it was a setup. But Jesus didn't condemn her. He just said, I don't condemn you. Just don't do it anymore. And I would imagine, I wasn't there, but I would imagine that the love poured out of him and that she could sense the love of the Lord. Hmm. Well, here's, here's something to think about. It's a little rabbit trail, but we're going to run down it for just a moment. If Jesus doesn't condemn you, then neither does the Father condemn you, and neither does the Holy Spirit condemn you. Because these three are one, and they are what one uh, word in the Bible calls it. They're, they're integrated. They're together. They're unified. 
They're combined. Uh, Matt, would you come up here for just a moment? Just walk over here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know what the Bible says about the apple in the Garden of Eden. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now, I would like to give you my Bible for a moment okay. and just set it down over there. Now, I want to ask the congregation this question. How did he receive that Bible? I gave it to him. I gave it to him. But somebody watching may say, by my hand, he received it. But I thought about it first, and my thoughts and my, the spirit within me handed you that Bible. Which one's true? They're all true. They're all true. I thought about handing him the Bible. I picked it up with my hand, and my hand gave it to him. But my hand is not separate from me. It's a part of me. And my hand moves because... The spirit in me decided to move it. Thank you. That's the way it is with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may receive something by the Spirit. The Lord may speak to you, but it's all the Father. And as confusing as that sounds, we must take that into the area of when we feel condemned, we need to realize that the Bible says that Jesus doesn't condemn us, but God doesn't condemn us, and you're not condemned by the Holy Spirit. These three are one, and they are working together to set you free from everything that the enemy tries to put on you. It's kind of interesting. In John 10, 30, Jesus said this, I and my Father are one. We're one. It's interesting that Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why all three? Because all three are one. Three are one. You are not condemned by any part of God. I have actually heard people say, I know Jesus loves me, but the Spirit condemned me on this. No, no, no. You can't separate them that way. The will of the Father, the will of the Son, and the will of the Holy Spirit are identical. Do not allow anyone to imply that you are condemned in any way by any part of God. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. 1 John 5, 7, For these, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. See, God is three in one, but so are you. You were created in the likeness and image of God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says there that we are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. Isn't that good? So, now here's the deal. When you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your spirit man was born again and cleansed. But everything is not complete yet. You are in the process of being completely born again. You're, you are not completely born again yet. Spiritually, you are. But your soul, which your mind is a part of your soul, you've got to renew your mind yourself. The Scripture tells us that God renews our spirit every single day, but we must renew our mind. And your body, hello, look at your body. Do you think that that's the finished product that God wants for you for all eternity? Come on. No, it's not. So your, your body has still got to go through a process, and we need to realize, and I wrote it down uh, this way because I really, it, it ministered to me, This may sound like a paradox, 
The work is complete, but there's still a process to walk through, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is being renewed daily by him, and we are to be renewing the mind with the word. The body healing has been accomplished by his stripes we have been healed. But we must remember this earthly body will not be perfected until the rapture of the church. Whether you're living now when the rapture takes place or whether you have departed, your body is not going to be perfected until that day. You might think of it this way. You are living in a temporary type dwelling. Now, it's going to be refurbished. Your body will be brought back together. If, if you were cremated or you died in the ocean and fish ate you and they deposited you around the ocean in different places, <laughs> no, no, no matter what happened, okay, no matter what happened, God will call out, I don't know if it's going to be like a D8 ember or something, I, but he's going to call out something and your body is going to come back together and get caught up in the air and it will be a dead body until your spirit re-enters it, which has been born again, and then something miraculous takes place. Mortality drops off, you take on immortality. Corruption drops off, you take on incorruption. And we become as he is, and we have a resurrected, glorified body. But that's at the rapture. Until the rapture, you got to put up with what you got. But... We are responsible for what we have. You'll find in the scripture, the Lord gave, he gave illustrations about how he gave different people different things. And when the master came back, they were responsible for what he gave them. You know, you're responsible for your body. Hmm. I uh, did not hear a lot of applause on that, Jim but you are. Galatians 3.13. Now, in Deuteronomy 28, it tells us that the curse of the law is death, sickness and disease, and poverty. We all know that. Galatians 3.13 tells us that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. So, he died so we didn't have to. Your death is in your... Listen. You're never going to die again. You'll depart, but you're not going to die. Your death was recorded on the cross, all right, on Calvary. So, he died so we don't have to. He took stripes on his body. By his stripes, we were healed. And in Corinthians, he wrote to the Corinthians, and, and it's so amazing. He said, Paul said, for your sakes, he became poor so that you wouldn't have to be. Wow. Well, you're living in this temporary, it's not a, this is going to be your body for all eternity, but it's going to be refurbished. It's going to be renewed. It's going to be born again. That's going to happen at the rapture. But between now and then, you, you are the ones, you're the caretaker of the tent you live in. Some people need a trash compactor. Some people say, well, you know, when it comes to my body, I'm just trusting the Lord. The Lord's trusted you with it. Well, I believe in God, and that's enough. No, it's not. <laughs> the Scriptures tells us in James 2.19 that demons believe in God. It says they believe in God and tremble. Believing that God exists. You know, I, I, I see this on television. People will be in an interview and they say, well, what is your religion on a talk show or something, a, a secular talk show? And they say, well, I believe in God. Well, big woo. The devil believes God exists. Boy, does he believe it. 
I mean, he's, he's seen firsthand that God exists. We've got to trust in him, submit to him, and receive him into ourselves. And that's a big difference from just believing he exists. But once again, why is this happening to me? Get, get that question out of your mind. Why is this happening to me? I'll tell you why it's happening to you. It's because you're human and you're living on the earth. And when it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. Although we do have some authority over all of this. You know, last night, it was kind of interesting. I, uh, I heard that there was a big storm coming. And I looked at the weather map, and the radar was just a solid, solid stretch across this whole area. And so I told Loretta, I said, I'm not going to put up with this. You know, I've got the church and, and our house and, you know, some of my mom's stuff. And we got people in the church who've got a lot of problems. We're just not going to put up with this. So I just, and I'm not saying I did it. I didn't do it, but I'm just telling you what I did, and I'm just going to tell you what happened. I said, uh, I spoke to the storm, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to not cause any damage over me, my family, all that I oversee and all that I possess, Everything that you've entrusted to me, including the people you have entrusted to me, and all they have and all that they possess, this storm will not affect the Osage Beach area at all in any way. And so I'm watching this weather app and this talking person, and they've got this solid mass of red with a little yellow on either side and then green out there, and it's moving this direction. And he said, I don't know what's happening, but it seems like there's a break. And there, there was, the, the red broke like this as it moved over Osage Beach. And then as it got to the other side, it came back together. And he says, huh. That's what the guy says, huh. <laughs> I said, hallelujah. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We, we, we do have... We do have some authority here. And the same authority you have over the elements. You know, Jesus, now this is just a little a rabbit trail while we're down the rabbit trail. Jesus spoke to the, to the storm. He didn't pray to the storm. I love prayer. I'm not ditzing prayer in any way. But I'm just telling you, he didn't pray to the storm. He didn't fast. He didn't think pray. You know, sometimes we think pray. He spoke, and what he spoke was what he wanted. And he just commanded, he said, in the Greek, that word, when he told the storm to, to subside, could almost be translated, hush, And what happened? The storm shh. <laughs> Take authority. You have authority. Jesus didn't go out to the front of the boat and just think real hard. He didn't think to the storm. He spoke to it. You say, well, man, I'm going to feel foolish talking to the storm. Well, So you're standing there not feeling foolish by your house that got blown away, you know. <laughs> Sometimes drastic problems require drastic measures. And we got to quit doing what we do based upon what we think other people will think. And on how am I going to look at this? You know, and, and you can't get prideful in it either. I think I'm going to go out on the deck and my neighbors can see me. They know I'm a Christian. 
And I'm going to point in that godly way at that storm, and they're going to know what I'm going to do. And when, they, when that storm goes away, boy, they're going to say, wow, what a man of God. Storm, I speak to you in the name above all names. Yeah, come on, don't get showy. We're not talking about that. It doesn't matter what your neighbors think. Okay, I'm going to close with this. <laughs> I always think it's funny when I say that. Now I'm going to close with this. Because in my mind, I'm thinking this next five pages. <laughs> you know, but but I'm, not, I'm not thinking that right now. I'm not thinking that right now. <laughs> Let's take a look at a prophetic promise real quick of what the Bible says the Messiah would do. Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, Surely he, referring to the Messiah who was going to come, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You see that? Okay. Now, in Matthew 8, 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. Oh, yeah, by the way, demon possession is real. Jesus didn't cast out concepts. He didn't cast out epilepsy. I mean, he... He healed epilepsy. He cast out demons. They brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast the spirits, cast out the spirits with a word. He didn't cast them out with a monologue. He didn't cast them out by talking to them all night. He just knew his authority, and he cast them out with a word. All it takes is, in the name of Jesus, Go! And he healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Then in 1 Peter 2.24, 2, Peter wrote this, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. And then he quotes Isaiah by whose stripes you were healed. So, the word in the Hebrew there in Isaiah means that you are and will be healed. The word in the Greek is past tense in 1 Peter 2.24. It says, you were healed. So, where did the healing take place? It took some place, the healing actually took place some, somewhere between Isaiah and Peter. And what happened in the meantime, in the middle? The Messiah gave his life on the cross and redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is death, sickness and disease, and poverty. He took stripes on his body, and by his stripes we were healed. In the, under the old covenant, they were and were going to be under the new covenant, we were. It's past tense. It's already happened. We need to receive what we already have. And because we have been promised it, we should not walk in condemnation. It's, it's the Lord Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that wants you to be well. He doesn't want you to be sick. Do we get sick? Yes, we do get sick. But that's not the will of God, and you're not getting sick on purpose. So, what's the deal? Believe you have been healed. Receive your healing. We walk by faith and not by sight. And don't let the enemy tell you when you don't see what you already have, that you don't have it. And then all of a sudden you get into guilt and condemnation and go, what did I do wrong? You know what? I can't even face my Christian friends anymore because of, well, they're just going to look at me and they're going to say, well, you just didn't have enough faith. See, you got to quit 
doing what you think is going to please other people. <laughs> oh, I like this. Because this, this, this is when I get tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I fired a guy one time, and he said, you know, this is the happiest firing I've ever had. <laughs> I just... Listen, you say, well, Abraham, there was a time when the armies came against him and an angel went out in the middle of the night and killed 185,000 of the enemy soldiers. Killed them. And then the next day, Abraham got up and he went out there and the enemy was all dead. And they just picked up the spoils. And you say, that's the way it should be in my life. Yes, that was a miracle. But let me tell you something. Read the whole Bible, and you'll find Abraham fought a lot of battles. There were a lot of battles to fight. David went and actually picked up rocks, pebbles for his slingshot. He didn't show up to Goliath and say, hey, if God wants him dead, he'll put rocks in my slingshot. No, there's some things you have to do, and that's just it's, it's obedience. And don't think it's strange. I'm going to go back to what Peter said. Don't think it's strange that this fiery trial is coming upon you as though you're different from everybody else. No, no, it rains on everybody. When the rain comes, it rains on everybody. Okay? Unless you stand out in your front yard and speak to the storm and whatever. Okay. So I think probably I'm going to sum it up this way. The title of my message was Reject the Condemnation. Reject the con don't Don't take it. Because it comes from a lot of different angles. And especially when you start dealing with healing and prosperity, people think, well, what did you do wrong? Or most people aren't thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you. And now that's, that's an eye-opener right there. You know, well, what my, will my neighbors think? Half your neighbors don't even know who you are. <laughs> Unless you're Jerry. Now, everybody knows who Jerry is. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, Jerry. But, you know, Jerry's a friendly guy. You're probably not as friendly as Jerry. I think it's probably time to quit talking about this. <laughs> but here's, <laughs> here's what I put as my closing statement. Okay. We will encounter battles. Can we agree on that? But we win if we don't quit fighting. Now, the fight we're to fight, Loretta and I talked quite extensively about this last night. The fight we are to fight, the only fight that a Christian is told to fight, is the good fight of faith. Now, here's the deal. Why is the fight of faith a fight. It's because faith is just simply believing what God says and standing on it. And sometimes in order to believe what God says, you're like a fish swimming upstream. Everything is counter that. Sometimes it's a battle to believe what God says. He says, by the stripes you have been healed. And the enemy almost instantly goes, yeah, but look at yourself. How do you feel? Look at what the doctor said. Look at your circumstances. Does it look like you're healed? Well, you know what? Maybe you've done something that you should, you know, maybe you need to go to spiritual counseling to find, see, Counseling's good, but the best counsel's the word. The best counsel is just to believe God. Sometimes to stand in faith is a fight. Don't overthink it. Don't worry about it. Don't feel condemned if you don't see what you're believing. Stand fast in faith. Don't give up, and above all, do not receive condemnation.
for the circumstance that you see, but receive the blessing that you don't see that's been promised. And that's the end right there. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak the blessing upon this congregation, upon all who are watching today. Call forth a blessing upon your life. In the name of Jesus, amen.